Hello? Jens told me I could talk about anything I want, so here goes. Um, some of you uh, may have seen, I, I gave a keynote at CPBCon a couple of years ago. In fact, that may be part of why I'm here, uh, is that uh, for some people, anyway, it went over pretty well. And what I try to do, I think keynotes are different than other kinds of text talks, so I wanted to make sure that my audience came away with at least one piece of useful advice that would stick with them. And does anybody know what that was? Yeah, that was it. If you're arguing, you're losing. And if you want to talk about persuasion, if the goal is to try to get people to think your way, once you get into argument mode, you've lost. And so today, I'm going to try to give you another similar kind of useful nugget, although it's going to be part of a larger social experiment that I'm inviting you to participate in. By the way, I think part of the phrasing there is key. Is, um, it's actually a simplification of a bit of advice that came from Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, a book which, if you haven't read, you should read. But the, notice that Carnegie's phrasing, the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it, is not quite as snappy as if you're arguing, you're losing. And so that's why I prefer the shorter articulation. Anyway, what I want to talk about is that you know, sometimes what we do as a craft employs real science. It's mostly mathematical science, but it's stuff like that. Unfortunately, too often it doesn't. And whenever this subject comes up, when I'm talking to colleagues, uh, uh, it seems to be immediately I get agreement on the, the fact that, not the fact, the observation that the practice of software development would benefit if we all practice it with a little bit more scientific rigor. The problem is we don't know what to do about it. And so I'm going to try to make a suggestion. Now, previously, I took a stab at this. This is about 10 years ago. I gave a keynote at the ACCU conference entitled C and C++ Programmers and Truthiness. And uh, you can still find the abstract posted online. Let me just read you the relevant parts. It's C and C++ Programmers cling to programming styles and practices that are unsupported by evidence and sometimes even contradicted by it. There's a comedian in the United States, Stephen Colbert, who popularized the word truthiness to describe the human trait of knowing something from the gut without regard to actual facts. And what I tried to do was take a lighthearted look at C and C++ programmers' truthiness in the hope of inspiring a little bit more truthfulness. Now, I gave this talk numerous times in addition to that keynote. I gave it at a few universities and user groups. Unfortunately, there are no recordings out there uh, to which I can point you. So I'll say, I think still much of it is relevant, and if anybody wants you to want to invite me to give it somewhere, I'm happy to do that, but not today. After I gave that talk, people would send me links of other useful information. And one of them that was intriguing was this slide presentation on SlideShare by a gentleman named Greg Wilson. And it was called Bits of Evidence, subtitled What We Actually Know About Software Development and Why We Believe It's True. And his primary focus wasn't so much on the craft of software development, but on academic papers, reviewed papers in the field. And what he observed was that whereas in medicine, there is randomized double-blind trials are an accepted gold standard for uh, medical research. You know, there's stuff just doesn't get published if it doesn't pass this standard. But he observed that even the best of us, meaning people who are writing papers in computing journals, aren't doing what we expect of the makers of acne creams. You know, the st stuff you put on your face to remove zits. There are higher standards for that than the software, that we, the software papers that were being published. And he chided the profession for using low standards of proof. So my point is that I think there's general agreement that we could stand for a little bit more rigor. Now, it's worth pausing for a moment to ask why. Well, software does a lot of good 
but we're also seeing that it can do immense amounts of harm. I think uh, the human, human beings don't react until there are emergencies. Well, there's going to be ones if, someday, and that's going to be a real eye-opener. And uh, the hope is that more rigor will head that off or mitigate that. Um, I think a lot of my colleagues agree, but that, even that assessment is based on a non-rigorous sampling of the, of the pool. So if it's true, what might we do about it? Here's my suggestion is I think we should turn to linguistic framing. It's, in cognitive science, there's a branch uh, known as frame theory. And a frame is a mental structure. Basically, it's a neural network. It's an association of information. It's how your mind works. And frames shape the way we understand and reason about the world. Frames are mostly metaphors. And by the way, to do my scholarly uh, uh, due, due diligence, I can give you references that you can check what I'm talking about. George Lakoff is a principal resource for this stuff. A metaphor is an implied comparison. It draws a comparison between things which at first seem unrelated but actually have an underlying common property. Let me just give you a couple examples before I apply it to, what, to the topic. For example, morality is a very intangible quant commodity. It's hard to deal with it in the abstract. So what does our mind do? We form an analogy with currency. If I do you a favor, you will say, I'm in your debt or I owe you one. That's the way we traffic in these concepts. How about this one, emotions. As temperature, we talk about things like flames of passion or giving somebody the cold shoulder. Mood as altitude, keep your chin up, I'm high as a kite. Or this one, a journey, a goal as a journey. We talk about the light at the end of a tunnel. I'm in for the long haul. These are all frames, they're metaphors. It's the way we deal with these concepts. Now, you can use language to actually skew perception. Let me give you one example from the American political culture. 20, 30 years ago, if you listened to a discussion about tax policy, people would talk about tax increases and tax decreases. It's ideologically neutral. But now, if you were to look at the way it's handled in the US, one party in the United, the Republicans, who happened to be in favor of reducing taxes, realized we could bend the discussion in our favor by using the phrase tax burden or tax relief. What does that immediate, immediately conjure up in your mind? That taxation is an affliction, and that public officials who cut your taxes are good, and public officials who raise your taxes are bad. That's a frame. And it really does affect political discourse in the United States. So let's think about this with respect to the rigor of software development. Might the way we talk about software development be encouraging a lack of rigor? And I'll pick on one word in particular, and that word is theory. In science, what's a theory? It's an explanation of a phenomenon that's been tested and verified experimentally. But in normal discourse, everyday speech, what's a theory? It's a claim that's essentially a guess. It's possibly highly speculative. People say, I have a theory about that. No evidence, no testing, I have a theory. So. What I'm suggesting is that let's think about how we use that word. Consider this. What if we said, henceforth, we're going to use the word theory only in its scientific sense? What would that do to the way we talk about our craft, about what we know to be true, what we can verify? Might it not inject some additional rigor? So here's my theory. If we all start using words such as theory and hypothesis, as if we were scientists, it will lead us naturally to employ more disciplined approaches to software development. Except, it's not a theory. 
I have no evidence to support it. In fact, it's not even a hypothesis because I don't know how to test it. At best, it's a guess. It's an educated guess, but it's a guess. Now, how did I, what got me onto this? By the way, in case you, you were thinking, I'm Yoda, no. I'm Obi-Wan, that's Yoda. <laughs> My brother Joel, some years ago, started listening to podcasts having to do with religion and science and epistemology, how we know what we know, what we can prove, things like this. And we started having conversations about this. And somewhere along the line, he just decided, let's start talking like scientists. So when I would say, we're addressing a problem, and I'd say, I have a theory about that. He'd say, no, at best you have a hypothesis. And at first, you know, I'd say, come on, give me a break. But then I realized he's on to something. And for the last several years, we've started to use these words more judiciously. And it, and it has actually changed the way we analyze problems. Now, it's, this is anecdotal. This is our personal experience. But now, I talk like this. My brothers talk like this. My wife talks like this. My kids talk like this. We've built a culture around this. And we've actually raised our own standards for proof. And so what I'm doing is trying to invite you to join me in doing this. Now, I don't want to stifle open discourse, but I want to keep it honest. It's OK to speculate. It's just not OK to pass off speculation as a sure thing. And it's OK to say, I'm uncertain. It's just not right to pass it off as certainty. That's, that's the issue. So like any good self-help book, my suggestion is let's act our way to success. And it's if we were being scientific, how would we proceed? And here's some mon a mantras you might try. I tried to make these as concise as possible. If it's a guess, admit it. If it's a hypothesis, test it. If it's a theory, provide the evidence. Now, these are mantras. These are for personal recitation. These are not things that you use to admonish other people. OK, this is you want to invite them into the process. You don't want to badger them into complying with this. So what, what can you do to reinforce this? Well, get some buddies to help you with the process. It really helped having my Yoda. Put these, here's some suggestions. Put the mantras on a wall. Write notes to yourself. Put a poster, print them out, stick them on your wall. If you go to a conference like CPPCon, they, get you, they let you put a little saying on your badge. Two years ago, my saying was, don't say, hypothesis, don't say theory when you mean hypothesis. It's a conversation starter. Put it in your email signature? Eh, I don't know. Actually, I, I put it in there this morning, and then I took it back out. I didn't like it. It came across as badgering. This is hard to do on your own. It has to be a collaborative effort. So you want to invite other people to help you, you do this. Because it is a change in perception. It's a change in the way you use common, everyday words. Now, if you try doing this with a colleague and you meet resistance, you should back off. Remember, if your goal is to sway others to your way of thinking, what? Yep. If you're arguing, you're losing. Thanks for listening and considering.